couple of things. Uh, one, I will, if I can finish all the slides today, uh, then I'm thinking about having a class next Tuesday, the valuation chapter, and no class on Thursday. Then on the next Tuesday, you're going to have the exam. So on that Thursday, I might have office hours. So if you study in advance, you can ask me questions. Uh, another thing is videos are being put uh, on, the, on the internet. The first week's class is already there. I'm going to send you the link. And before the exam, probably we are going to have the capital structure weeks, two weeks of lecture as well. Uh, the payout part is blah, blah, blah. You can read it anywhere. Uh, and I put the sources I'm using. So if you want, you can read those chap chapters. Uh, and then uh, we have valuation left. I don't think we will have many slides in the valuation part. Uh, so I think we can finish it in, in um, two hours. And today I will definitely try to finish before six. But if I have like five slides left, if it is six, I will continue, of course. But I will try to finish before six. Okay. Uh, we talk about what dividends are, what is dividend yield, dividend payout, total payout ratios, and everything. Um, there are other types of dividends as well. So there are stock dividends. So basically what happens is companies give each shareholder additional stock. Uh, for instance, 100 stock dividend means uh, you have one stock on top of every stock you have. Okay, So you get one more share. 50 stock dividend means you have half a stock, half a stock for every stock you own. So stock dividends are like stock splits. And I'm going to give you an example later. 100% uh, uh, stock dividend equals to two to one stock splits. So, so for each stock you have, you're going to end up with two stocks. Uh, for 50% stock dividend, it is one and a half to one stock split. For each stock you have, you're going to have one and a half stocks. No value added by the dividend payment, okay? Uh, it's going to change the stock price, of course, but it's not going to change the value of the company. Uh, so basically, the, the stock price will decline, but uh, stock price will, will in, uh, in, uh, sorry, numbers of shares uh, will increase and stock price will decrease. So the total effect will be uh, nothing. There are also property dividends. These are really interesting. These are very rare. Uh, made up example, uh, you, if you have Heineken stock, for instance, they're sending you uh, a case of beer for every 100 shares. So the, but there are real world examples as well. Uh, Wrigley's gum, they send a box of chewing gum to the shareholders. So there are property dividends as well. Okay, uh, let's look at this uh, simple example on stock dividends. Imagine a corporation, it has 10 million shares outstanding and it is sold at $60, uh, and it declares, uh, declares uh, three for two stock split. So for each two stocks you have, you're going to end up with owning three stocks. Okay? So after the splits, how many shares will be outstanding? There are 10 mil million shares outstanding. Because of the three to two uh, ratio, you will, uh, the company will have 15 million shares outstanding, but the stock price will be uh, influenced as well the stock price will decrease to $40 per share. Um, very simply, why do you think companies might do stock dividends or stock splits? Anyone else? OK, yes. For example, the Apple shares, it's just like uh, traded at the 600 or so. So to make it more available to investors, they choose. Exactly. If the stock price is too high compared to the competitors, it might be a trouble for the company because investors can, might not afford the, the stock. So to decrease the stock price without changing the value of the firm, this is what companies might do. Exactly. OK. Um, we, can, we might also see spin-offs. So what happens is a new company is generated and the parent company investors are paid uh, by new company's shares. So parent company shareholders own parent company stocks and also the subsidiary stocks. Uh, and we see that in the Travelers and City Group case or Kraft and Altria Group case, this is another way of distributing money to shareholders. 
So they are giving shares of uh, their subsidiaries, let's say. Um, another thing, something popular has become popular in US is DRIPS, dividend reinvestment plans. So basically companies allow shareholders to uh, invest their dividends on the company again. Why is it good? Because normally you get your dividend payment and then you have to pay commission uh, and what have you uh, to buy stocks. But with a dividend reinvestment plan, you're not paying uh, any commissions and you're buying more of the, of the, of the company. So this is, this is good for both parties. And uh, to see why it's important, so if you are getting $80, uh, sorry, $30 in dividends in a quarter, uh, when uh, there's an $8 commission to invest uh, the money, you will just prefer to have, uh, to be in dividend reinvestment plan, so you can just pay, uh, you can use that $30 to buy more stocks in the company. This was another reason why, uh, when I asked you, would you prefer a dividend paying stock or not? As you can see, you can get the dividends and make more investments, and with a drip plan, you can, if you're happy with your company, if you're happy with the future prospects of the company, you can make, uh, you can reinvest in the company without any commissions. So this is uh, getting very trendy in US. Uh, taxing, uh, we talk about capital structure and we talk about how taxes Im are important. Uh, I'm gonna touch base dividend taxation now and then at the end of the class, again, I'm gonna go back to taxation of dividend payments because they're important. Uh, there is double taxation in, uh, in US companies uh, for, for dividends. When I say double tax taxation, what am I talking about? Companies pay taxes on their taxable income, right? Think about the income statement. There's earnings before interest and taxes. Then the company pays interest and then we end up with uh, EBT equal to taxable income. From that taxable income, tax is paid to the government. So the corporations are paying uh, tax to government at around 35%. And then net income, we find the net income and then dividend payments are made to stockholders. In that case, as stockholders, we have to pay taxes on the dividend payments because it is, um, it's increasing your income. So because of that, we, see, we, we, we say there's double taxation in, in US. So what, how do you think this tax will affect the value of stocks in a positive way or in a negative way? So this tax goes to, when I say, when I talk about value of stocks, I'm talking about value to shareholders, right? So when shareholders are paying taxes, what happens, are they left with less money or more money? Less money, so it should affect the value of stocks in a negative way, right? Because the tax is going to the government. And we're going to see theories about it as well. Okay, uh, let's look at this example, uh, just mathematical representation of what I just said, um, combined with how pension funds are getting favorable treatment uh, from, from governments. Uh, suppose that we have, we have two investors, one individual investor, one pension fund, and they both invest in the same, same company. Operating income is 100 for both. Uh, of course, the company pays corporation tax, uh, 35%. Um, and they both get, they get uh, the remaining part as a dividend payment, no retained earnings. But as an individual investor, we have to pay tax on our dividend payment, which is around 15% in US. But pension funds, they are kind of required to buy income stocks. On top of it, they get favorable tax treatment. So they don't pay tax on the dividend payment. And as you can see, the cash you receive is $55, whereas for pension funds, it's $65. So there is the effect of, of uh, tax on individual investors as well as pension funds. Um, I'm, we are talking about dividends, dividends, dividends. Let's look at what happens when there's a dividend cut. Of course, there should be a negative or positive reaction when there's a dividend cut. Negative. It should be negative, of course. And um, <coughs> average decrease in share price is around 4%. Average loss in the market value of equity is around $30 million. And this is from a study by Lee and Lee. Uh, the second Lee is Eric Lee from the University of Iowa. Uh, he was my professor 
And actually, he got, I always uh, advertise him, not that he needs it, uh, but uh, he was in Times 100 most influential people list uh, when I was there. Uh, not because when I was there, but it's because he uh, wrote a paper about uh, stock options and backdating. Uh, I will talk about it in the corporate governance part of the class, actually. Um, very nice guy. Okay. Uh, Interesting thing is the second part. When companies need, need to make dividend cuts, yeah, <laughs> dividend cuts are bad, you know, you see bad market reaction. When companies has to have to make uh, dividend cuts, that's interesting. Um, they cut dividends real, r really, really a lot. What I mean is, um, so suppose that they need to make a dividend cut. They say, OK, we have to make a cut anyway, and there will be bad market reaction. So let's make the cut really big. So when you have bad news, give really, really bad news to, to investors. And this is actually not surprising. There are lots of studies uh, which look at different uh, bad announcements. And this is the general consensus. Uh, this is what we see in real data. When CEOs have bad news, they try to give all of them at the same time, not spread it over time, so that you will have one bad market reaction, then things will get smoother. And average, uh, on average, post-cut dividends are around 60% of the pre-cut dividends, which is a, a big number. They're cutting 60%. Um, and dividend cuts average 60 times the size of the dividend increases. Why do you think they are very, uh, they're very conservative when they increase dividends, but uh, very, very um, relaxed when they're doing dividend cuts? Which one is more sustainable? Making huge div in increase in dividends or dividend cuts? Exactly. If you increase dividend payments, uh, you make a huge increase in dividends. It, it, it's not that sustainable. You have to stick with it all the time. So in this case, they say, OK, we're going to make the dividend cut really bad. Then things will go better. But if you increase dividends a lot, then you have this long-term problem. Are you going to be able to keep it in the long run as, long run as well? Um, an interesting thing, Lee and Lee show that they look at average abnorm abnormal returns, how markets react to dividend cuts throughout time, from 1963s to 1990, uh, 2000s, let's say. As you can see, market reaction gets less throughout time. Um, one question I'm going to ask, when it says abnormal, abnormal return, what, what does it mean? Abnormal return. You know how to calculate return of, of stocks. It's here. This is the return. Dividend price change compared to the initial price. What is abnormal return? Yes. Is it more than expected return or maybe less? When you say expected, OK, you're comparing your company's return to a benchmark. Generally, we use the market return. So. Are you getting return on top of the market return or less than the market return? And this is what we generally do in academia, OK? Why are we comparing with the markets? Because we want to smooth out all the market crisis, right? If seeing a, a stock decrease in a bad market doesn't mean much. But having a stock decrease in a good market is a bad thing, right? So you have to smooth out the, the market effect. Did you, did you get what I just said? OK, perfect. OK, so people are reacting less and less to uh, dividend, cuts, uh, dividend cuts throughout time. Why? Maybe because com uh, investors are becoming more informed. They are looking at the reasons why there are dividend cuts. Maybe there is a really good investment opportunity for those companies. That's why they are cutting the div dividends. But this good investment will turn uh, into long-term um, well, uh, well, long-term wellness of the company, in that case, it's not bad. So maybe we are becoming more informed about our uh, investments, so we are uh, giving less reactions to uh, company announcements. Okay, so we spend a lot of time on dividends. 
There is also the share purchases part. Let's go over share purchases. Um, so another way of distributing cash to uh, shareholders is share purchases. Again, board of directors decides on it, and they decide how many million of shares uh, will be repurchased over the over time. And what happens is, uh, I, as a comp the company, let's say, I repurchase stocks from you. <coughs> I pay cash, um, and. What hap this generally takes place in what kind of market? Primary, secondary? Secondary? It actually depends. <laughs> we will see. Uh, share purchases have become more common uh, in, the, in the US history. And I showed you this graph before. Sharehold, uh, share purchases as a percentage of total payouts increased over time. <coughs> OK. How do shareholders benefit from it? Uh, what happens? So the firm repurchases stocks. We uh, pay st uh, shareholders cash. And then this, this stock becomes treasure stock, as Ahmed said in the, first, uh, uh, in, in the first lecture. And what happens is the remaining shareholders who choose not to sell their stocks, uh, now they all, you own larger portion of the company because treasure stocks are not uh, voted as, uh, or are not counted as ownership in the company. So People who didn't sell their stocks own larger shares of the company now. So you will get larger share uh, cash payments in the future because you own more of, of, more of the same company. There are different ways of doing uh, repur uh, share purchases. One is open markets. So the company just acts like any other in individual and they go into the market, buy the stock uh, at the market price. The second one is tender offer. In that case, company gives a higher stock price. Uh, it pays a premium over the market price to make the share purchase more attractive, right? So instead of paying the market price, like in the open market case, uh, the company is paying more money to, uh, to investors. There's that Dutch auction, uh, econ people uh, will like it. So basically, the company gets bids from shareholders form a demand curve, and then pick the lowest uh, price. Uh, and uh, according to how many uh, shares the company will buy, uh, the company picks that uh, low price. That's the Dutch auction. The last one is direct negotiation with large investors. So they just purchase from large investors. One example of it is green mail. That's interesting, and we're going to talk about it in, I think, governance section. Uh, green mail is kind of like black mail. So what happens is there's this target company, and I'm, let's say I'm the CEO of this target company, and for some reason, another company wants to buy my company. So what I do, or, or starts buying my company, it's a hostile uh, action. Uh, so little, one, little by little, that, com that company is buying stocks of my company. I go to that acquiring company and I say, look, I'm going to buy stocks from you at a premium. So I'm kind of blackmailing them not to buy my company. So this is uh, an example of how CEOs can negotiate with uh, large investors. OK. Um, why am I blackmailing or greenmailing the acquiring company? I mean, very straightforward. I'm the target company CEO. Ali John wants to buy my company, and I'm I'm telling him, okay, I'm gonna buy stocks at a high price than you, so just leave me alone. Keep the control. I want to keep the control, and the reason why actually companies are being acquired is more, it's because one reason might be again an agency problem. Maybe I'm a really bad CEO. <laughs> Probably not, but I, maybe I'm a really bad CEO. And, uh, and Ali John says I can uh, I can manage this company better than her, so I will use whatever the company has. So I should just give the opposite example. You know, you should be the bad CEO. I should be the good CEO. Whatever. Okay. So uh, he says, okay, there's very really uh, good value of the assets of this company. So just the manager is bad. So I will just. Uh, you, I will use my CEO skills, and uh, this, this is going to be a good investment. I want to keep, to keep my, my, my job. Interesting thing, a study actually showed that 
in, nor in normal acquisitions as well. Two companies start negotiating, and of course, target firm uh, gets some premium. Otherwise, target firm shouldn't sell itself to the acquirer, right? right? So I should get something from this acquisition. Uh, a study show that if, um, okay, for uh, acquisitions where the target CEO keeps a, a seat in the board of directors of the merged firm, the, the premium paid by the acquirer is less. I'm, I'm kind of buying my seat in the new company at the expense of my stockholders, right? I'm getting less premium from, from the acquirer just to be able to get a seat in the merged company. So you shouldn't trust CEOs, okay? They know too much, okay? Oops, what did I say? Okay, um, so how do you use, uh, why, why are we using uh, share purchases? I told you the problem with dividends. Dividends are sticky, companies cannot change their dividend policies much, but share purchase is a one-time only thing. So in that case, um, companies might just prefer uh, share purchases when they don't want to see a big negative reaction from, from investors. And it's also good for shareholders. Why? Because they don't have to pay tax on dividends like in the, in the share purchase. I mean, of course, they, they pay capital gain tax if they get a high price compared to what they paid for, for the stock. But anyway, they can get that uh, money and uh, spend it on another investment, for instance. Um, okay. We look at this before. Uh, so what, uh, what we saw from here was generally companies pay out more cash to investors as we, uh, as we move uh, in time and uh, share purchases are becoming more popular. Now let's just summarize what we talk about and it's actually from Lindner's, uh, Lindner's 1956 uh, paper. Uh, we went over all of these actually before but let's just summarize things. One, firms have long-term target dividend ratio, dividend payout ratios. Mature firms have high payout ratios. Growth firms have low payout ratios. We talk about it uh, because growth companies need money and they don't have much cash inflow. Uh, managers focus on dividend changes rather than the absolute levels of dividends. Okay, So a dividend cut or dividend increase is more important than keeping the dividend level fixed. Uh, dividend changes follow shifts in the earnings. Like as the earnings increase, you expect dividends to increase as well. So short-run fluctuations in the earnings don't change the dividend policy much. Why? Suppose that you have a bad earnings. On top of it, if you make a huge dividend cut, you're going to have double the, you're going to see a really bad market reaction. And if you think you can reverse things in the following year, why are you cutting the dividend? You don't need to do it. So dividend uh, payments are smoother compared to earnings. Um, another thing we talk about, managers are really reluctant to make changes in the dividend policies. Um, so if they announce a dividend increase, a big dividend increase, they might need to uh, change it in the future and they don't like it. Um, and because of that, managers are very conservative about dividend policies. We saw that dividend cuts are bad, bad market reaction. And you, a company cannot increase uh, or uh, um, a manager cannot fool the investors all the time increasing the dividends, right? Because as a CEO, you might just say, okay, I'm going to announce an increase in dividends and everybody will think we're doing great, we're going to have lots of cash flow, and uh, I'm going to signal something good. But it's not sustainable, okay? You cannot fool the investors all the time because you have to make cash payments to, and you cannot um, create cash by magic, okay? You can increase earnings with magic, but not cash, okay? Um, and firms repurchases for two main reasons. One, if a company has lots of cash, they need to return that money to shareholders. And another thing is maybe, we talked about capital structure and leverage ratios before, maybe the company has very low leverage ratio, and if the, the manager wants to increase the leverage ratio, share repurchase is a good way to do it. So they are uh, buy, basically, um, as, uh, they are buying back stocks from investors, and automatically leverage ratio will increase. 
because equity is decreasing. Now let's look at the information content of the, the payout policies. Uh, so I talk about them little by little uh, in, the, in the first hour. So now we're going to look at what kind of information content we have in dividend payments or share purchases, how the market reacts to those. I think this is the part you're interested in, uh, more realistic stuff. And uh, we are going to see whether those changes in the, in the, in the market, uh, stock price, will affect uh, the CFO action. Okay, the first thing, the, the first very important thing is dividend signal cash flow uh, and earnings quality. Okay, so what it means is, I just said that, you can manipulate earnings, legally or illegally. Okay, there are ways to do it, and we talk about it in the first week actually, a little bit. But cash is not very easy to manipulate. So a company cannot, can inflate earnings, but the company cannot go on uh, paying dividends. Without cash, it doesn't own. So that might be a problem. And if this happens, then there should be a dividend cut. And having dividend cuts or trying to issue, uh, finance uh, those uh, dividend payments with debt or equity is really expensive. So instead of it, uh, managers are going with more reasonable, sustainable dividend policies. And in general, we can say a company paying dividends signals good earnings quality. Okay, because the CEO thinks earnings will continue to go sustainable and they will be able to make the dividend payment. Um, and investors uh, react or take the, the, the changes in dividend payments in different ways. Um, we talk about it. If there's a dividend cut, it means the company is in trouble. So there will be a bad reaction from the investors. Um, if there's a huge increase in dividends, then people will say, okay, that's a good thing. The company is doing well. So we might see an increase in stock price. Um, so in general, um, and another thing is a company paying no dividends start paying dividends. So we see an average 4% increase in the market when a company initiates uh, dividend payments. Um, this is from this is how the, this is an example of how market reacts to dividend de decreases or dividend increases from the study of Aharoni Eher and Suari. Uh, these are cumulative abnormal returns. So as you can see, when there is a dividend decrease, there's a huge, uh, not huge, but uh, the, there is a uh, negative price reaction by the market. And when there's a dividend increase, we see a positive market reaction by the market. So dividend cuts are bad, dividend increases are kind of good. Um, another thing about dividend payments is that we talk about institutional investors. And institutional investors buy what kind of stocks? Income, huh? Income. Income stocks, stocks which, has, which pays lots of dividends. Um, in, that, in that case, we can also say, OK, these are big investors. It's not, uh, it's not like you and I, right? These are very informed uh, investors. So they closely monitor the, all those companies. So you can say if a company decides to pay lots of dividends and become an income stock, the CEO agrees to be more transparent or agrees to have more monitoring from institutional investors. So in that case, again, a, div a dividend payment or high dividends, are, they're a good thing, right? because there will be more monitoring. When you look at the uh, uh, share purchase ca case, um, it's, as I said before, it's a one-time commitment. So it's, uh, um, it's not like dividend policies that you cannot alter, alter that much. Um, so firms basically repurchase shares when they have lots of cash and when, uh, when, um, when they want to increase leverage. So the question is to you, uh, is this for you? So why, I mean, both of those things are actually bad, like the, the company increasing leverage or the company has lots of cash. Why do you think the market uh, stock price increased by 2% on average when there's share repurchases? Yes? You buy the stocks uh, by thinking it will increase in the future when they're investing. And this is actually the same for the company, if they repurchase their stocks, uh, they think that they uh, those stocks are undervalued, then they decide to buy it. 
remember we talked about issuing stocks and we said the company CEOs generally issue stocks when their stock is overvalued or undervalued. They issue stocks or will it when they can again they, they can get a high price from it this is just the opposite share purchase case when the CEO thinks that their uh, stock is undervalued they're gonna do a share purchase remember they are generally on general day in the in the tender offer they uh, pay more than 20 percent on top of the market price so they have uh, good prospects good expectations about the, the future of the company so that's uh, definitely one thing Another thing is the agency problems. Remember, I always talk about it. If a company has lots of cash, we might have agency problems, okay? It might be the CEO not making uh, enough investments. It might be the CEO spending the money on his uh, own interest. So all those things will create agency problems. So we can say that share purchases are taken as a good thing because of those two things. It should decrease agency problems and it also shows what the CEO thinks of the company. So the CEO thinks it's undervalued. Um, so as you can see, I, I gave you some examples of how market reacts to changes in, in payout policy. And you can, um, we, we, we see that the mar for, for the market it's important. All those information is important. But the question is, do you really think uh, the payout policy can change the value of the firm? And for that, we have theories, like we had in the capital structure. And just like in the capital structure theories, we have a controversy here. And in academia, we love controversies, so we can write more papers. So some people say dividends are good, you should pay dividends. Some people say dividends are bad. Some people say dividends are irrelevant. Guess who says dividends are irrelevant? Modigliani and Miller. For them, everything is irrelevant, right? <laughs> okay, so with uh, Modigliani and Miller, they say, look, the firm value is ba based on the assets. Uh, companies actually issue stocks to pay uh, dividends. And uh, in that case, there is no wealth creation. Then there is a follow-up uh, idea or study of uh, Miller, Black and Scholes. Uh, you're going to be very familiar with Black and Scholes in the options part. Uh, we're going to see them uh, in the options part. Uh, they, they confirm the same thing. They say value is not created, uh, paying dividends. Then there are people who say dividends are good. So the, the reason why they say dividends are good is because of the things we talk about. Investors like income, you can get the dividends and make investments or you can get the uh, dividends and you can do consumption. Dividends are good. Also, when there are dividend payments, uh, th there's less agency problems because there's less money in the company. So the CEO will be more careful about which projects to choose. And then there are the dividends are bad people. So basically they say, because of the taxing, because some money goes to the government, actually dividends are um, destructing the value that should go to the shareholders. And we're going to look at all those things uh, one, by, one by one. So let's start with dividends are irrelevant people, uh, case, Modiglia and Miller. Uh, so the, suppose that we are think, thinking about companies which has fixed investment and borrowing plans. So we are not changing capital structure. We are not uh, changing uh, investment decisions. And the firm needs a certain amount of cash for the investment. And this comes from borrowing, and some cash comes from retained earnings, and some excess cash is generated, and this money is paid out as dividends. Um, so if the company wants to increase dividends, where, does, where the, the cash will come from? All the money is uh, used for investments. Okay, there's no, no money left. Uh, in that case, the company should issue new stocks. So what happens in that case is, the total value of the, the, the company will not change. Why? Because we will just see a transfer of ownership from old stockholders to new stockholders. No change in the value of the firm. Remember, we are looking, at, looking from the firm's perspective, not the old shareholders, new shareholders' perspective. So let's look at this. <clears throat> so this is the Modigliani Miller case, okay? So they, this is the total value of the firm. They assume total value of the firm doesn't change. 
So this is the value before dividends, this is the value after dividend. And these are the total number of shares. So before the dividend payment, so this is each, uh, the worth of each share, okay? And after the dividend payment, suppose that new stock is issued. This is the, the basis of their assumption. Uh, new stocks uh, are issued to, um, to finance the dividend payment. So now, as you can see, we have more shares outstanding. The total value of the firm is fixed. Now what happened is the value of the, the, the value that goes to all stockholders actually decreased compared to before dividend case. And new, uh, new, uh, since there was stock issues, new stockholders get some value from the company. Overall, there was just transfer of ownership from old stockholders to new stockholders now. So the total value didn't change. So this is the basis, ba basis of Modigliani and Miller. Um, this is another example of looking at the same thing. I changed the order of slides a little bit, so don't get confused with the same thing. Okay, this is uh, Iowa City Inc. balance sheet. Uh, so suppose that the company has $1,000 cash. It's, uh, hold for, uh, it's held for investment. $9,000 worth of fixed assets. There's some investment opportunity. It's going to create some MPV value. So total asset value is 10000 plus MPV. Since this is a balance sheet, you should see the firm value on the right-hand side as $10,000 plus MPV as well. Suppose that the company doesn't have any debt. In that case, all the value is the equity value, $10,000 plus MPV. So in this case, suppose this company wants to pay dividends of $1,000. And this money will come from where? It's going to come from issuing new stocks. So in that case, what's going to happen is, since there's no change in the uh, fixed asset part, all the changes will come from basically um, just dividend payment and issuing stock part. So in that part, the value of the total market value of the firm will still be same. It's going to be $10,000 plus MPV. But look at what new shareholders get, what old shareholders get. New shareholders will have $1,000 of the value, all the stock uh, issues. Uh, and the old shareholders will have 9,000 plus the, the MPV. But on top of it, old shareholders will have dividend payments of $1,000. So as you can see, uh, when you look at the total value, it's going to be fixed, $10,000 plus MPV. Nothing changes. I know it has lots of assumptions. It's not very realistic. But this is the world of Modiglia and Miller. Uh, do I have the... Okay, I don't have it, but... But, uh, just like in the capital structure part, they have lots of assumptions about, the, about this world. So it's a perfect uh, market, uh, full market efficiency, which is not realistic, but it's a way of looking at things. Um, okay. Another thing, if you want to look at decreasing dividend case, I, uh, before I showed you uh, dividend payments, if it is the case, then what's going to happen? Again, investment and borrowing decisions are same. So because of the dividend uh, cuts, there will be extra cash. And um, this extra cash will be, um, will be, this extra cash, uh, will be um, used by, um, I forgot the word. OK, uh, buying stocks from, uh, from, from shareholders, for instance. And in this case, again, there will be no change in the value of the company. So dividend increase or dividend cut, it doesn't matter. Total value of the firm doesn't change. Uh, as I said, they have lots of uh, simplifying assumptions. Like, again, there's no taxes, no cost of uh, equity, nothing. Uh, the, the, the changes in assumptions might make dividend policy more relevant, actually. Okay, uh, Miller, Black, and Scholz, again, they support dividends are irrelevant uh, theory. And they look at the supply case. Basically, they say if firms can increase their stock price playing with dividend increase or decreases, they would do so. Um, dividends are, are at those levels and they don't change much. It's because uh, the changes in dividend po policies doesn't affect uh, the, market, uh, the market value. Think that way. If a company can increase its value by increasing dividends, they would do so all the time. 
they will try to do it all the time. But we don't see it. Why? Because uh, changing the dividend policy doesn't affect the value of the firm that much. So this is what they're, what they're saying. And they say there are different firms with different payout ratios. So, uh, so there's demand and supply. There are investors who prefer certain types of firms. And there are firms which have certain types of uh, payout ratios. So it's win-win. We are in equilibrium. So dividend policies are irrelevant, they say. Let's move to the dividends are good camp. So basically, they, uh, they say there are institutional investors. There, there's a natural clientele for high dividend stocks. Like we talk about pension funds, we talk, there are university endowments. They, they buy um, co from companies which pay lots of dividends. Retired individual, for instance, we talk about them. They live on their uh, income on dividend payments, um, for instance. And behavioral finance people actually say uh, people like income from dividends because they don't want to make decisions themselves. Remember I said uh, dividend payments are good even for young investors. Why? They can get that dividend payment, look for another investment, and just make more investments. But most people, like behavioral finance people, actually prove that people don't want to make decisions. So it's OK. It's better for you to just get the dividend payment and spend the money, for instance. So for those reasons, uh, there are some people who say dividends are really good. Another reason why uh, we said dividend payments are good is because of reduced uh, agency problems. We talk about it. If a company has lots of cash, the CEO might invest in negative MPV projects. It might be an empire builder. You know, just the CEO wants to uh, manage a very big company. So the only thing it's important for the CEO is making the company big, which means make lots of acquisitions, bad or good. Um, and by regular dividends, by paying out some money to the, the shareholders, actually uh, CEOs can uh, be more careful about what investments they are, they are choosing, and they, will, they might be interested in creating value. Um, the last theory on payout policy is the dividends are bad camps. And the reason why they say dividends are bad is because of the taxes. So I'm going to spend the remaining part talking uh, about taxes a little bit. Um, so as I said before, uh, there is double taxation in the in, uh, in US. Corporations pay um, income taxes to the government. And then when you get dividends, you should also pay uh, tax to the government because of that. And also, even if there is no uh, dividend payment, when you sell your stock, if you sell the stock for a higher price compared to the, the price you paid for the stock, you have to pay capital gain uh, tax to the, to the government as well. OK, so the people who say dividends are bad say, you know, investors should have all the cash. Why are we uh, giving the money to US Treasury in the form of tax? OK, and those uh, people say, companies shouldn't pay lots of dividends because the government is enjoying it. And this is actually bad for shareholders. And if the company needs to return money to shareholders, then they can do repurchasing instead of dividend payments. Um, OK. It, uh, things that are important here is, um, so if I'm paying tax on, on dividends, then I should prefer dividend paying stocks less compared to non-dividend uh, non paying stocks. Um, and when I buy stocks from dividend paying uh, companies, much of the value will be, will be going to, to, the, to the government. So the thing I need to look at is actually I need to compare the tax rate on the dividend payment and the tax rate on the capital gains. And if the tax rate on capital gains is less than the tax rate on dividends, then I will uh, actually I, I will accept a lower return from securities paying low dividends. So it's just when, when are you going to be better off, uh, getting dividends or just enjoying the uh, or uh, just uh, being stick with uh, capital gains? Okay. So let's look at an example we have here. We have two companies. 
I changed the names, it's A and B now. Uh, and suppose that there's this tax system, it taxes dividends at a higher rate than capital gains. So you pay more tax on the dividend payment. Uh, okay, A and B have the same risk characteristics. A pays no dividend, B pays dividend. Investors expect the price of the A to be 111.5, and investors, investors expect the price of B to be 102.5. Okay? So they expect the uh, price of B to be less than A, but be careful, there's a $10 dividend payment, so together it's actually their equivalent, 112.5, right? $10 dividend pr uh, plus the price. So let's look at uh, what investors are willing to pay for those stocks. Okay, so for A, next year's price is 112.5. Help me with, the, with this because I'm going to ask you where the, these numbers will come from because I might get confused. So next year's price is 112.5 given for A. Dividend pay, there's no dividend payment for A. So pre-tax payoff is 112.5. So if you sell your stock, this is what you're going to get. Today's stock price is 100, let's say, for the no paying uh, company, no dividend paying company. So how do I cal cal calculate the capital gain? How do I calculate the capital gain? What is capital gain? Price change. Change in price, exactly. So the uh, next year's price is 112.5. Today's price is 100. So you get the capital gain of 12.5. So rate of return on this will be how much? Stock, stock price is 100. Capital gain is 12.5. So it's 12.5%. This over this, right? That's it. OK. So since there's no, uh, t uh, t uh, there's no dividends, there's no tax, so there's zero, you get 20% capital gain tax. So you pay uh, tax on this 12.5. Right? Okay. So total after tax income is how much? You get 12.5 uh, capital gains tax minus the money that goes to the government. So you have $10 after tax income. Okay. So after tax rate of return will be 10 over 100. So 10%. Right? Let's look at the same thing for B. So uh, next year's price is 102.5 with $10 dividend payment. So total payoff is what? 112.5 stock price plus the dividend you're gonna get. Today's stock price is lower for, for B. Why is it lower for B? Because it would appreciate to 102. Hmm? Sorry? Because it would appreciate to 102. Okay. So Anything else? Dividend, dividend tax. Okay, good, 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 good. I think it was in the next slide, if you have the slides. Okay, let's continue. Uh, and we're going to answer it in a second. Okay, so today's stock price is 97.78. What is the capital gain? It's the difference between next year's price and today's price, right? 4.72. Uh, rate of return is 15%. Where does this come from? Dividend plus capital gain. Thank you. Don't forget the dividend. You have the capital gain plus dividend over the stock price. So it's, it should be 15%. What I have in the board is what we just did. Okay? Capital gain plus the dividend over the stock price. 15%. So you pay 40% tax on dividend, which is 4 you pay 20% on the capital gain, 0 0.94. So total after tax income is how much? You get 10 dividends plus 4.72 capital gain, minus you pay $4 tax on dividends, uh, $1 tax on the capital gain. So you end up with 9.78. So the after tax rate of return for the company is 10%. Again, it's not coincidence. This is what I wanted to have. So basically, management of B, it's pays dividend, it can reduce dividend payments and increase the stock price from 97 to 100. 
because A, it couldn't firm, it didn't have any dividend payments, and the stock uh, price was uh, 100 for them. So basically, someone said because of the tax. You, you said that? Okay. Because of the tax, investors are aware that some money will go to the government. That's why they're pricing the dividend paying stock at a, at a, uh, small, at a um, smaller price. That's why it was 97, not 100. Um, so this is what dividends are bad camp are saying. They basically say, you know, if you can get rid of dividends, it's a good thing. It, it's uh, because governments will not have uh, taxes. What does empirical evidence say? Um, okay. Um, this is actually very difficult to show. This is what I was going to say. So we are thinking about expected yields, expected returns. These are very difficult to calculate. Uh, and also dividend payments occur four times a year. Uh, but uh, basically um, investors can just not buy those stocks on certain days, like those four times, like ex-dividend dates. They can just uh, stay away from those uh, stocks and not pay divid dividend taxes, basically. Um, if you want to look at uh, evidence from papers, I found very old papers, actually. Uh, Litzenberger and Ramaswamy, they show that investors pr uh, price stock as if dividend income has an additional 14 to 23 percent tax over capital gains. Miller and Scholz, on the other hand, remember, they talk about dividends are irrelevant. Uh, they said investors price stock as if dividend income has own an additional 4% tax o um, over, over the capital gain. So basically, in real world, we should see uh, less effect on dividend payout policies if we can fix capital gains tax to, to dividend tax. And this is actually what we are saying. Uh, but before go showing you the tax uh, evidence, let's talk about share purchases and taxes. In the share purchases, you buy the stock and you only pay the capital gain tax if the stock price is higher than what you initially paid for the stock. Um, and we can say share purchases have a tax advantage over, over dividends in general. Dividends are taxed more, let's say, conservatively, let's say. Um, but if all the companies eliminate dividend payments and start share purchases, what's going to happen? The government is not stupid. They will start taxing the share purchases this time. So they're going to play with capital gains taxes. Um, and another funny thing we see is when companies talk about uh, share purchases, they never talk about tax benefits. So they say, our stock is a good investment. We want to have the shares available to find acquisitions of other companies. They talk about all the good reasons why they are uh, repurchasing stocks. Not the tax. Actually, tax has, a, has an important implication for payout policy for companies. Um, and also, um, one little uh, thing I'm, I will mention before I will start uh, summarizing things. The worst possible case for dividend payment occurs when a company has to issue new stock to fund the dividend. And actually, this is what uh, Modiglia Miller assumed, right? And in that case, what's going to happen is, in real life, because we have taxes now, in Modiglia Miller there were no taxes, before we have taxes and transaction costs, we're going to uh, destroy the value of the firm uh, because of the, the cost of issuing new equity. So you're going to increase the cost to, to the company uh, to be able to pay dividends, which is, which, which is a bad thing. And if a company has to be, has, has to face with a decision like that, uh, they should, they, they'd rather cut dividends instead of issuing stocks to, uh, to be able to finance their dividend payments. And this is actually what we see, that's, that's interesting. Um, so again, here we see different dividend yields, and here we have new issuances. So normally what we, we, we should see is, uh, here we see comp companies paying no dividends, they have very high uh, stock issuances. Why is it the case? The same thing, these are probably growth companies. They don't pay dividends. They need money. They issue stocks. This is not surprising. Look at this part. This is really interesting. 
These are companies with very high dividend yields, more than 4.5%, and look at their new issue uh, case. So it's almost like companies are really issuing stocks to be able to pay their dividends, which is a dangerous territory, actually. So that's the last interesting graph I'm going to show. Let me give you some blah, blah, blah information about dividend taxes um, in, in, in US. Uh, so from all those things, you can, uh, you can take now uh, what happens in the U.S. is um, ordinary dividend, uh, dividend tax and short-term capital gains are fixed at the same rate, 15%. Uh, so normally ordinary tax rates are around 35%, capital gain rates are around 15%. Uh, so they, they, uh, up to 2013, they take ordinary income and dividend taxes the same. Of, uh, beginning in 2013, they changed a little bit. They increased the uh, capital gains tax rate for high-income people. Uh, probably it is the uh, Democrat effect in-house. Um, but then we say um, uh, later years, this is what we're seeing. This is the difference between capital gain tax and ordinary income tax. As you can see, in 1950s, there was a huge gap between ordinary income and capital gain taxes. Then they fixed it here uh, in 1986, if I remember correctly. Let's say, yes, 1986, they equalized uh, dividends and capital gain uh, taxes. Then the gap increased again, but beginning of 2000, 2003, they made it same again. So as you can see, actually, whenever we are, we are talking about those payout policies, this has important implications for fiscal policies and tax policies as well. Um, but we can say that we can say that um, companies are using less and less dividends because of many different reasons, and they're using share purchases more. One reason might be the tax effect as well. But um, I think to be able to say dividends are irrelevant is kind of too much. Uh, so it, it, in the Modiglia Miller world, we are making lots of simplifying assumptions and it's not very realistic. And I, sometimes I say dividends are good, sometimes I say dividends are bad for different reasons we talk about. Some people like uh, money, they like income, they like dividends, uh, they, they get uh, the money, they use it for consumption or they get the money for future investments. Or there are some people who say dividends are bad because of tax, double taxation problem. And in that case, share purchases might be a good thing. Um, again, as I did with the capital structure, I'm not giving you a clear picture of what companies should do because there are lots of decisions related to that. So it's up to you uh, to decide uh, what is good, what is bad for your own company, for your own markets, with the tax system, legal system, and everything. Do you have any questions? Okay, then I will see you next week. <laughs>